Our next and final speaker of the morning is Lori Zappay. Lori is the Executive Director of Electronic Arts Intermix in New York, a nonprofit organization that is a leading resource for media art. She has been active in video art exhibition, distribution, and preservation for over 30 years. She has curated, lectured, and written extensively on media art and organized numerous curatorial, preservation, and educational projects with emerging and established artists. She has developed EAI's major collection of 3,500 new and historical media artworks, initiated its pioneering video preservation program, inaugurated and co-authored its extensive online publications and digital resources, and has developed numerous long-range projects and artistic programs for EAI. In 2012, she curated the exhibition Circa 1971, Early Video and Film from the EAI Archive, a major historical survey at DIA Beacon on the occasion of EAI's 40th anniversary. Lori has organized numerous video screening programs and exhibitions at venues including, is it LA Boral? Sorry. La Boral, thank you, Art Center in Guillaume, Spain, Bowdoin Museum, Maine, Museum of Fine Arts, Lausanne, Switzerland, Jeux de Pomme, Paris, and Institute of Contemporary Art, London, among many others. She has lectured extensively at museums and universities around the world, she has also taught extensively and has served on numerous international panels, symposia, festival juries and boards, and has served as consultant on numerous media art projects. And Laurie's current project, which sounds really fantastic, is um, to be produced this August, and it is an outdoor video program for the ruined Gothic choirs for the Archaeological Museum in Lisbon. Laurie. Thank you very much, Tiana. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, John Hanhart. I am so thrilled to be here. Um, it's so wonderful to be doing this presentation and to having this discussion about conservation and exhibition of Namjoon Pike's work in the context of the extraordinary exhibition, Namjoon Pike Global Visionary. Uh, I think in many ways this exhibition is really a perfect illustration of the themes of, today, of today's discussion, which is the enrichment of our understanding of an artist and his work through this um, kind of integration of and exhibition of extraordinary wealth of materials from the archive and from the Pike archive. So um, I, I'm deeply appreciative of having this context in which to speak. Um, my presentation today is going to actually pick up some of the themes. Um, I think in a way that, that John introduced this morning, I love that John's uh, title, Permanence, Namjoon Pike Permanence and Change. Um, I'm going to be speaking about the conservation of Pike's single channel work through EAI, um, but not just the conservation, it's really the conservation within a very specific context, again, of, of bringing in a, a conservation formed by a rich historical context, histories, processes that speak to us, and we hear the artists speaking to us across time. Um, I'm, because again, I'm speaking from the, the perspective of a very specific type of archive, um, what I call a living archive, as EAI's archive is non-static. It's in constant motion, constant flux, constant migration. We hold a collection of some 3,500 media artworks, and we have a commitment both to the preservation and stewardship of the collection, but also to its distribution and to access. So again, we're dealing with a collection that, that as, to use John's title, is really in, in a kind of state of permanence, but also a state of change. Um, I think my presentation may be a bit more anecdotal than technical or scientific, um, because again, the artist's presence has woven through our relationship um, with his work. Um, Namjoon Pike was very close to EAI's founder, Howard Wise, um, dating back to the 1960s. Um, I myself had the enormous pleasure and privilege of working with Namjoon um, since from the 19, early 1980s at EAI. Um, so there, there's, the, there's a kind of, again, um, rich context uh, uh, supporting documents and anecdotes and materials that really inform the way that we conserve and uh, distribute his work. Um, EAI was also um, very honored to receive from the Pike Estate um, a special collection of some 211 works, uh, raw footage, insta installation elements, outtakes, wonderful materials that is being held not for distribution but as a special collection. We've cataloged it and um, that work is in 
here at the uh, Smithsonian American Museum, uh, uh, American Museum of Art, and will be um, uh, available for research and study, I believe, here, which is extraordinary. Um, what I'm going to do in my presentation is kind of take you through a series of uh, works and bodies of work by Namjoon that are at EAI, and, and to use them as kind of um, maybe case studies, we can say, um, to discuss some of the, as Mike put it, challenges <laughs> and issues around this kind of uh, conservation, very specific uh, areas of, of conservation and uh, distribution of Namjoon's single channel work. Um, in John Hanhart's wonderful essay uh, for this exhibition in the catalog, he argues that Namjoon's body of single channel videos are, quote, understudied or underappreciated for their prescience regarding the future of our media culture. And I really can't agree enough. I think the single, the, the single channel video works of Namjoon Pike are extraordinary. They're under recognized, understudied. And so um, I, I hope to just, just begin a kind of uh, my part of the conversation here today with some observations and illustrations. I'm going to be showing you some illustrations and materials from EAI's archive um, to kind of just explore how the act of conservation can also be, is also an ongoing process and an ongoing, in some ways, act of collaboration with the artists across time. Now, I should mention I'm going to be toggling between uh, PowerPoint and video, which is a little bit dangerous, and um, we'll see how that goes. Um, okay. I, also, I want to say just something very quickly about the title of my talk. Um, because my original title was um, From Analog Assemblage to Digital Experiments, Preserving the Single Channel Media Works of Namjoon Pike, which I thought kind of cleverly incorporated um, the title of two of his pieces, titles of two of his pieces, um, Analog Assemblage and Digital Experiments at Bell Labs, while also alluding to the technological and cultural transition uh, from analog video and the kind of analog world to digital media and our current digital world. And this trajectory from analog to digital is among the, the, the it's one of the most profound changes um, that we've seen in, in culture and also for, for all of us working in, in media art. Um, and has had a profound effect on the creation, exhibition, distribution, and preservation of media artworks. Um, and I thought these two titles really tidily summed up this trajectory. But when I looked at it more closely, I realized that the reality is more interesting. Of course, Digital Experiments at Bell Lab was a, one of the earliest extant Pike single channel pieces. It was made in 1966, of course, at the pioneering research lab, Bell Labs. Um, and of course, it's, it's a 60 millimeter film referencing digital data code. And in fact, the last single channel piece that EAI has in, this, in our collection by Namjoon Pike is Analog Assemblage a work that is a short re-edit and reworking of footage from his early analog video piece, 92369, Experiment with David Atwood. So in fact, in this kind of, uh, the way that, it, that Namjoon ever confounds and um, turns our expectations upside down, um, in fact, the, the correct title is from digital, experiment about, from digital Experiments to Analog Assemblage. This is a still from Digital Experiments at Bell Lab. And Analog Assemblage from 2000. Now those of us, I think probably everyone in the room here, um, know that media art is, is we're dealing with variability, fluidity, mobility, it's built into the very DNA of media art, it's a defining characteristic from early analog video to works that are made from digital source code. Media art is mutable at its very essence, reproducible, based in technologies that are constantly in flux and can be experienced in multiple contexts and across multiple formats and platforms. And this variability and mobility have actually, of course, activated media art from, its, from the beginning of its evolution. Um, in terms of the, the work that we're doing at EAI, just very generally in terms of exhibition, distribution, and preservation, it's hard to under, uh, uh, understate the importance of this transition from analog to digital. Um, this is a moment when artists are mastering works on file formats, exhibitors are displaying from hard drives, museums are acquiring works as uncompressed files. It's a moment where moving image media works 
um, are, are shifting. There, there's a, the, the notion of platform agnosticism where works can, can, can drift from screen to gallery to your iPhone, et cetera, um, even at the same time where there's a, a return to a call for medium specificity. Um, it's a moment where uh, works, can, the, the same work that, that perhaps uh, is being uh, conserved in a major museum conservation department is also being streamed on YouTube. And so these, these kind of multiple versions, multiple platforms, multiple iterations are, are among the most dynamic but also challenging conditions that we're working with in terms of, again, distribution, exhibition, and preservation of media artwork. Now, of course, now we add to the mix an artist like Nam June Pike, whose, um, whose art makes deliberate and canny use of remixing, recycling, reworking, revisiting, and re-editing the purposeful embrace of randomness, improvisation, spontaneity, and error, the playful and often irreverent adherence to flux, process, interactivity, exchange, and collaboration. And you have what may seem like a conservator's nightmare, but to me feels like, in a way, a dream. Um, of course, Nanjum was decades ahead of culture, decades ahead of remix culture. He's been there from the very beginning. And so um, this process of rediscovery, re remixing, re-editing is part of what, we, again, we're dealing on a daily basis in terms of distributing and conserving his work. So I want to say just a few words before I jump into very specific examples of Nam Jun's work at EAI and how we've kind of worked through it over the years and some of the conditions around it. Um, just a few notes about our preservation uh, policies or our pres preservation procedures in general. Um, we're one of the oldest existing organizations dedicated to video as, as an art form. We were founded in 1971. So our collection, <laughs> um, is, we're almost like a museum of obsolete formats, let's put it this way. I think one time I was asked to, to say how many you know, obsolete formats or how many different formats we had migrated the collection through over the years and how many different formats were represented in our collection. And I think I, I started counting, we had some count and we stopped at 52. Um, this, this, the, the collection, again, um, really spans, in a way, the history and the scope of the medium. Uh, the earliest piece in the collection is indeed by Namjoon Pike. It's a 1965 work, Button Happening. Um, I didn't have a picture, oddly enough, of uh, a half-inch open reel. I didn't call one in from storage of one of uh, Namjoon's uh, earliest, kind of the, the early half-inch or CV uh, masters. So I just had a still of this is from 1971 by the collective Ant Farm, Ant Farm's Dirty Dishes. And if you notice something interesting on the spine, you see EAI001. It was actually the very first work accessioned into the EAI collection. Um, so we, again, we, we house, this is our, our media archivist inspecting a half inch tape. Again, we have these you know, extraordinary amount of, of obsolete formats which are cleaned, migrated, transferred, et cetera. Um, and this is um, the collection today. This is our server um, where we um, are storing thousands of files, digital files of the works in the collection. So we, are, we have an, uh, the, our, our preservation procedures right now are really about, this, again, this transition from analog to digital as we continue to constantly migrate the works through various formats. Um, we're still migrating works on digital beta cam, but we're also, of course, making files in mul multiple file formats. I, I, I can speak to people at lunch, people interested in the kind of file formats we're doing, and some of those technical things which may be of interest. I won't talk about it really here, but just to say that, um, again, because our mission, we have a dual mission in relation to the collection, which is both uh, preservation as well as access. We're making um, uncompressed files for preservation, but we're also making multiple format access files for um, our viewing room, for our online viewing site, we have 1,600 titles available to be viewed um, via a password-protected site. And we have, um, of course, we're, we're, we're also, museums are exhibiting files, so, so there's multiple uh, file formats. Um, and we're also working on a major educational streaming initiative um, where we are hoping to uh, provide access to educational institutions through a subscription service to um, the works in the collection for viewing uh, uh, libraries and schools digitally online. 
um, which is very important to us. And we also, I should just mention quickly, we also have um, online resources around preservation and exhibition, including an, an online, research, uh, online resource guide for exhibiting, collecting, and preserving media art, an HD guide for artists, um, uh, our online catalog itself, which is a repository of, of information around the collection, and um, a project called A Kinetic History, the AI Archives Online, which is really um, uh, online access to primary documents around the early video movement. Um, this is a very unglamorous shot of what digitiza digitization at EII looks like. Basically, this is uh, uh, the ongoing digitization of the collection. Um, we also, again, these are just details that we can talk about informally at lunch, but we also have a very intense, customized uh, collection management system database where we collect 73 fields of information for every artist in the collection and 103, 103 fields of information around each title. So, okay. so now to move into specifics around Namjoon Pai. So the first body of work I'd like to talk about um, are really the works that came into the collection at the time, or close to the time that they were made. Um, and we could, because we have a lot of primary documents around the, their, their uh, coming into the collection. And these include the important series of works that, that Pike made for broadcast at the public television stations WNET 13's TV lab and also WGBH's new television workshop in the 1970s. And as I said, Nam Jun's relationship to EAI went back many, many years. Um, he was very close to Howard Wise, who from 1960 to 1970 ran the Howard Wise Gallery on 57th Street here in, in, in New York. Um, and Pike was represented in the landmark exhibition, TV as a Creative Medium, in 1969 at the Howard Wise Gallery, with two pieces. Um, this is uh, still from uh, Charlotte Mormon performing the TV bra for Living Sculpture, and also Participation TV. Um, both of those were at the uh, TV as a were represented the TV as a Creative Medium exhibition. Um, now, EAI's distribution service was started in 1973. That's the same year that Pike made Global Groove. Of course, one of the pivotal works in video art history and it remains one of the most important works made on the uh, uh, convergence of art, television, and culture. Another key work from this period is a tribute to John Cage, made in 1973, um, which was re-edited from its original 60-minute version to uh, 29 minutes in 1976. And I think it's not insignificant to mention that many of Pike's important broadcast works from this period were re-edited from their original hour-long running times to half-hour versions, including the um, iconic Suite 212, created in 1977 and re-edited in 1979, and I think the under-recognized Guadalcanal Guadal Requiem, which was made in 1977 and re-edited in 1979. So again, we're dealing with already even at the beginning in the 1970s, at the time they were made, we're dealing with multiple versions of works, of these broadcast works. Um, as I said, Global Groove uh, entered EAI's distribution service soon after its creation, and it appears in the very first catalog of EAI's distribution collection in 1975. And there are no catalogs for 1973 or 1974, so this is the first catalog we have where we see that, Namjoon, that, that Global Groove actually appears. Now this is a very blurry photo, I apologize, of the original database. <laughs> this is the database um, at EAI. This, this was, they're, these are, are they're among our, amongst our most cherished possessions because they are leather-bound volumes, library cards, handwritten, which are the kind of library cards, catalog cards, of the collection. We think it, they were made, it was created actually in the mid 70s. Um, there's anecdotal evidence to say the mid 70s. Um, and that's the, the library card for what we believe is the accession of the three quarter inch ma dub master of Global Group because it was received in 1978. Again, the catalog tells us that it was already at EAI by 75, um, but you have these, these kind of wonderful handwritten notes. Um, including the astonishingly late date 
of 6988 handwritten note island video. Now that would be very mysterious except I'm very old and so I know what island video, I know that island video was a production, a post-production house in New York. So I'm assuming that there's, again, it's all detective work at this point. It's very, you know, it's, it's kind of wonderful um, primary documentation that helps us kind of understand the history of, not, of, of the collection, the history of Namjoon bringing the masters in and just trying to kind of piece together this this rich um, information around these works. Oops. Um, this is just now a quick view, quick blurry view of some of the, the database record, current database records of EAI's uh, database on Global Groove. Like I said, we have 103 fields of information now on Glo Global Groove. So um, we're tracking this now, but we're also tracking it back. We have extensive notes on this ephemera, on, on the, the, the paper documentation around this work. Um, I should mention that also the that collection management, the database you just saw, directly, it, it's a dynamic database that directly um, impacts the, the, our, our, our online catalog, the public catalog, which includes all these resources for the public around the works in the collection. Now this, for all the for, for kids out there, this is, what, this is what you did before computers. These are actually the handwritten pages um, that track the dubs made from Global Groove. And these pages are, again, amongst our most precious uh, doc documents of EAI. They're fragile, as you can see, they're torn apart, but you can actually see you know, the, 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 number, the dub numbers running down there. What is maddening is that there are no dates on them. <laughs> um, okay, just a few of these. Sorry, I've just been told my time is clicking by much faster than I hope. Okay, um, so, so just to say that again, the story of the preservation of some of these early pieces really is also the story of, of migration. Um, we, we migrated uh, many of these works in our first preservation project in the, actually in the mid and late 80s. They first went to one inch analog broadcast uh, uh, tape, which was the received preservation format at the time. They were then re-migrated to the, one of the early um, archival digital tape formats, D2, and then when that became obsolete, they were re-migrated to digital Betacam, um, and now, of course, we have digital files of these works. Um, so it's, it's, again, for these works, which came in very early into the collection, it's been a story of migration, 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 which is not um, without its challenges, again, for a, 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 an organization, particularly a nonprofit, trying to you know, be on top of this massive collection and these iconic works. Um, okay, because time is really clicking away, I'm gonna turn now to another, a kind of a lesser known work though that, me, that to me kind of describes what happens um, when a living archive, a, dis, a, dis, a distributed collection, meets an artist who is um, interested in this idea of variability, reproducibility, chance, error, et cetera. Um, in the 1980s, as John mentioned earlier today, Namjoon made a series of international satellite telecast projects, uh, uh, starting with Good Morning Mr. Orwell in 1984, Wrap Around the World in 1986, and Bye Bye Kipling in 1988, these kind of global interactive performances via satellite. But at the same time, he was also creating a series of short single channel pieces that indifference to the broadcast works and to the satellite projects, to me read almost more like sketches. They're on a more intimate scale. And one of these is Butterfly, a short two minute piece from 1986. Um, the story of this is, that I'd like to tell, is that when Pike <laughs> brought to us the dub master for distribution of Butterfly, um, our technician looked at it and realized that the ending cut off 10 seconds too soon. It would have been a mistake in the dubbing. So he called uh, Namjoon, told him about this. Namjoon looked at the incorrect tape and loved it. Um, he then, <laughs> th that the, the 10 seconds of signal noise at the end of the piece became part of the piece. It was integrated into the piece Butterfly. In other words, you know, we know that Namjoon was very interested often in uh, the, the, the conceptual, the technical, the cultural meaning of the error, the technical glitch, etc. But here's a, a case where, in fact, the process of migration, of transferring, of 
you know, dubbing this, duplicating this work for distribution actually became, in a way, part of the piece. The technical process, the process of migration became incorporated into the piece. So this is, these are Nam June's handwritten notes on the cassette for Butterfly. This is the three quarter inch master. There's a black spot, which I like very much. Keep it in the one inch uh, transfer, keep high chroma, et cetera. Let me just And this is, we actually have this Xeroxed, and this is in, in the database. Um, piece continues exactly 10 seconds after the last picks and sound. Um, I find these handwritten notes to be incredibly moving. To me, this is Namjoon's voice, the presence of the artist, the voice of the artist speaking to the future. It, it's, it's his instructions. Um, it's interesting that, again, this error became incorporated into the piece, but then it was very important for him to maintain the piece in this fashion, that, that, that the future uh, technician knew that the 10 seconds of noise at the end was actually part of the piece. And for anyone, for a two minute piece, a 10 second uh, signal of noise is like an eternity. It's like an awkward pause in a conversation. So it's very important to know that that's actually part of the piece. I was going to show Butterfly, it's two minutes, and I wonder if we have time. We have, okay. But I still have a lot more to talk about. <laughs> go back very quickly. I know my time is running out and I haven't even talked about two entire bodies of work. Um, but I will try to make it quick and try to get to some things. Um, another body of work that I was going to talk about quickly are some of, um, is some of Nam Jun's very earliest pieces. These are the pieces that he made pre the Pike Abe synthesizer. Um, uh, some of the, the, the electronic manipulation pieces. And to be honest, this, this is a note to Howard Wise about this material. This, this material was legendary AI because of this note to Howard Wise. The best recommendation for this tape, that's the CV stuff, these are the early half inch um, material that he made, off, many of it, much of it in conjunction, a collaboration with Judd Yalkut. Um, don't rent it for 20 years, you'll love it after 20 years. Um, 
and if you read this, Goya's contemporaries loved the perfect oil painting, but after a century or so, his rough esquisse got freely recognized. I made many kinds of distortions in the 60s. CV stuff contains, uh, contains some of them, not all. At least I love these tapes, not for sentimental reason. However, I repeat, don't rent it, don't complain about it. <laughs> um, wonderfully, in the 1990s, um, through Preservation Project, these works came into our collection, um, and I think, I, again, I, I, I'll just show slides here because th these are some, uh, to me, some of truly the most important revelatory works by Nam June. They really opened up a world to us of understanding his, they kind of, to me, presented a link between some of the early um, uh, performance, music, electronic manipulations, and the later videotapes and installations. Many of them were made in conjunction, in collaboration with Judd Yaukut. I know he spoke in April here, um, spoke wonderfully and very um, interestingly about the process of collaboration, the fact that these were actually shot on 16 millimeter film, um, and as he said, you know, some of these pieces, it, they read as video pieces, but belying their origin as film. So um, the, the great videotape study number three came into our collection at this point. Again, not until the, the, the 1990s, which is quite extraordinary. Um, again, I'll just click through these slides so you see some of this extraordinary material that didn't come into the collection until quite late. I was also going to talk about the fact that these were actually shot on 16 millimeter films and were originally projected as film. Um, for the exhibition I did at DIA, um, this last year, I was able to, after talking to Judd about the original exhibition, was able to, to show these as projections, which was actually quite wonderful to see them in projected form. Um, maybe I'll just, to move very quickly, the, the, the last set of works I wanted to talk about were actually, again, some of the, again, some of the very earliest works that came into our collection quite late. Um, in the late 1990s, in preparation for John Hanhart's major retrospective exhibition, The Worlds of Namjoon Pike at the Guggenheim Museum, um, he undertook uh, with, in, con in collaboration with uh, Stephen Vitiello, who I think also spoke here in April, who you know as a musician, composer, artist. Um, he also, for many years, worked with EAI as a uh, uh, director of special projects and preservation, uh, worked on a major project to um, kind of, a, again, a process of exploration in, in working with Nam Jun closely, going through this, to, to his own personal archive, and uh, uh, doing a lot of work to, to discover some of these um, pieces that had thought to be lost. This is um, a, a series of stills from 923-69, Experiment with David Atwood, which I think many, Nam Jun considered his, he said, this is my image processing masterwork. I agree, I think it is truly one of the extraordinary works of 20th century art. Um, this piece, again, came to knowledge through this preservation project um, uh, with John Hanhart, and I think it was may, may have been shown for the first time in 30-some years at the Guggenheim for that exhibition. Um, I could speak about this piece forever. I could do hours. I just, I, I love this piece, <laughs> and I'll just show a set of stills from it, um, because I think, again, this is an example where through preservation, we, um, it, it, it was discovered this revelatory work that shed new light on our, on our understanding of Pike's process. You see him, in, in effect, it's, it's capturing a live um, uh, performative, uh, it's almost like Pike inventing some of his visual, his, his grammar of, of image processing pre-Pike Abe synthesizer at WGBH uh, TV. And um, finally, in the interest of time, Oh, again, there's so much. This is also material that, that came about, that, that was discovered um, for, for John Hanhart's show at the Guggenheim, this wonderful performance documentation from Nam June's personal, personal archives, all of which, again, had, been, uh, had not seen distribution, seen light, seen exhibition for decades and decades. So again, this idea of, of working closely with the artist to uncover these marvelous, important historical works. Um, I was going to show lots of video, but um, again, I'm out of time. So I want to close with just a still from, again, the 2000 piece analog assemblage. This piece is, is, a, is a two minute piece that was actually culled from the footage that, uh, of, from 923-69 experiment with David Atwood. Um, Pike was invited to present a piece in 2000 at the exhibition event Media City Soul, and um, he asked Steven Vitiello and Seth Price of EAI to work with him to, to condense this footage into a, a short 
two minute piece. Um, and to me that is, again, so indicative of, e even at that point, Pike was re-editing, remixing, reworking this extraordinary footage. Um, it, it, to me, in a way also, even the, the idea of collaboration with the young artists, that this reworking, revisiting, radically transforming this early footage is in some way also an act of preservation, of migration, of restoration. And again, it's through this process that we see from the digital experiments through to analog assemblage, the artists continuing to speak to us across time. And we continue to hear the artist's voice and see the artist's presence across time. Um, I don't think there's time for me to show an excerpt from analog assemblage, is there? Maybe? <laughs> or I can, I can just stop there, time-wise, okay. So I think with that, just, just with, the, with the vision of Namjoon speaking to us across time, I'll stop there and thank you very much. Oh, okay. Sure. Thank you, Lori. I'd like to now invite all our morning speakers to the stage um, for our We've written panel discussion um, with morning speakers, and sometimes these moments are an opportunity for the speakers to ask questions of one another. However, I think we will open up questioning to all of our guests. We do have two microphones in the auditorium, and if you raise your hand, um, my colleague Susan on this end, and I think Chris will help pass microphones around. Do we have any questions from the floor? Fantastic. Gwen, you'll have to forgive me. It's a little dark, but I think between Susan and I, we'll see everyone. Oh, maybe down. Yep. Testing, testing. Testing. Oh, it works. <laughs> And what the um, steps are being what steps are being taken in terms of preservation of the actual film and video content and the role that the estate is playing in that? It seems like it could be difficult to decipher as you're viewing them um, if it, that is the way the film is supposed to look, et cetera. And I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about that process. Um, the it's an ongoing process. I mean, it, it really was an an enormous volume of material. Um, there. We're still sifting through it. Uh, we're working quite closely with John Huffman and, and uh, the estate to uh, help us identify what the material is. There are a number of pieces that our registrar has come across uh, sort of in sifting through the archive that are, it's, um, it's unidentifiable. Um, there's a, a couple of tapes, for instance, it was reel-to-reel -reel tape that had additional material attached to it, such as grains and dirt and glue and paper. Um, and it, it, we were unsure when we first uh, looked at this material as to whether it was intended to be uh, run through a projector or if it had any content on the tape itself. Um, and our uh, Lynn Putney sort of gathered this material together and um, uh, so we sent it off to be analyzed. Uh, there was indeed an audio track on the tape. We're still trying to determine what it was used for. I mean, this is, uh, it's a learning process, but it's uh, really kind of fantastic um, to rediscover some of this material and to determine what it is to, uh, John May, yeah. I was just kind of, you. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's like a deep dig, you know, into the archive. And um, in addition to the textual material, I, I just like, Greg, could you get a microphone and explain the thing with the computer cards? Remember that we talked about? <laughs> no, no. I'm just, I'm just. Uh, Greg Zinman is working with me on a number of projects and uh, is a postdoc in the archive. 
And I've seen these, uh, I just can't describe these computer, and we we're talking about revisiting it and seeing what it is. Well, sure. I mean, the, the archive has uh, thrown up a number of, a number of riches, and uh, people have mentioned that there is a lot to explore there. And, and one thing that uh, caught my eye very early on were um, uh, reams of computer paper printouts of uh, right. Fortran. Fortran. Um, Nam June had been uh, programming at Bell Labs, and we, we saw still in, in Lori's wonderful presentation. Um, but there's more, there's more computer work by Nam June from the mid '60s that hasn't been seen. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have we, it's, it's wonderful. We have the Fortran, and Fortran's not a dead computer language. Um, we can, and we hopefully will, uh, run these these programs and see what they result in. Uh, we have some ideas from a couple of printouts, but uh, these are works by Nam June that have, have never been seen. Um, and it's, it's that kind of opportunity to, to rethink um, his media practice uh, in an even earlier mode uh, and, and doing digital work before a lot of other people were. That's, that's so tremendously exciting. Yeah, I just, when Greg, when I'd seen these originally, I'd referred to them in my essay, I didn't realize you could actually possibly run these. <laughs> Fortran, that's what I didn't know. So, it's, the, it's the beauty you know, of scripted thanks, language, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So there's a lot of that kind of material there. Does that answer your question at all, Gwen? <laughs> well, it's, it's a very big question. I just w was interested in hearing just some of the... Um, what, what the uh, strategies were w in just massive amounts of video and film material and just how do you even begin and then how do you develop sort of a preservation plan for that? Right. And it sounds like right now you're through the digging process. Yeah, I, I would actually say, Gwen, just from a conservation standpoint that we really are taking it one step at a time as things are discovered. It, there's a constant dialogue with the registrars, with the curators to try and come up with, okay, well, what is it, is, you know, what needs to happen, how do we need to re-house uh, it, uh, what, you know, does it need to go for migration, those sorts of things, and it's, it's a really case-by-case case because it is a vast amount of material um, that still remains to be completely cataloged. And there's also a, a, a bit of triage that has to happen with an archive of this size. We have to really determine what, at what risk is the material initially once we identify what it is, how risky is it to leave it as it is, or how quickly do we need to archive or migrate it to uh, a more stable preservation format? And I, you know, there are a lot of uh, concerns around, I mean, we, you have, that has to be funded, we have to put resources into it, we have to find the appropriate people for that, so that, you know, it takes time, but I think um, uh, we have really dedicated people involved in it at the moment, so. Um, I think I'll take the question here first. And then. Hello. Oh. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> I want to know what are your fundamental uh, processes for uh, evaluating a a product? What would you look at? as far as evaluating if you want to take it into the program. May I respond? Yes. It's an interesting question. I mean, the question about how do you evaluate how, when you were looking at this large mass of material, and uh, there are a number of things that uh, I would immediately mention, and that is one looks at a videotape or of a segment of material in relationship to what we know about the artist's work. How does this piece, um, uh, when was it made, how does it, uh, historically important relationship to his other work. And then there's the issue about how does it relate to the entire media and art culture in terms of what kind of issues is he addressing, how does it visually look and play against uh, issues within conceptual abstraction, and different genres and categories of art uh, of the late 20th century. So there are various um, sort of platforms that one brings to bear to evaluate the work, to understand it, 
to place it in the context of the artist's entire body of work, as well as against the larger video and media culture. Okay, but do, do you have a standard? Yes, there, 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 those established standards. Those Written in blank. Well, there is, uh, these standards are described through um, in the literature around the bodies of criticism that exist at the time when the work was made and shown, as well as art historically. Uh, there's a large body of art historical literature that's emerged that looks at this work, evaluates, understands it, and considers it. So yes, uh, that's all part of the, the literature uh, on the history of the moving image and the media arts. Okay, that's all the Thank you. Thank um, you. We have a number of questions, so we'll start right. next to here on the edge, and then Chris, if you could bring a microphone down to the front row. Thank you. Um, I just want to reiterate uh, the, the thanks um, that, that has been offered to each of you for a fabulous set of presentations. They're incredibly um, stimulating. Um, my question, I think, really builds on Gwen's, and it has to do with this question of cataloging, archiving, and the very, very thorny problem of the original. Um, and I speak as an art historian um, who grew up in the age of um, physical objects. Um, and with this uh, understanding that somehow there is an original that we can um, come back to. But Laurie, I found extremely interesting the point you made about the multiple versions of Pike's works that exist. And Greg, it's really interesting to hear about the existence of pieces that perhaps have never been performed before or seen before. And so um, I'm very, very interested to hear how from a cataloging perspective, um, and John, I uh, would look to you for this particularly, how you are grappling with this problem of the so-called original and the um, fact that Pike, of course, during his own lifetime was continually, allow continually allowing things to um, be reinterpreted, was reinterpreting things himself and, himself. and as you um, seek to interpret the archive, how you put um, new discoveries side by side with um, maybe the accepted body of work that was understood at the time of his death. And perhaps we can even imagine this in terms of a question about how one would go about compiling a catalog raisonné of Pike and whether that model even makes sense um, when we look at his work and think more broadly about time-based art and its ongoing preservation and interpretation. Thanks. Well, I want to make a note. I, I want to turn that over to you oh, okay. primarily. <laughs> but, but I do want to make a note because it is interesting just in, in terms of my introduction of maybe the distinction of EAI's archive as opposed to the great museums you know, here and the museums who, who own Namjoon Pike works, both single channel and, and other media. Um, because in a funny way, we started from the opposite, how can I put this, almost like the opposite mind frame, which EAI's collection was, was initiated at a time when it was, I think, a, a, we were really re dealing with the works as reproducible. It was, again, it was about distribution. Preservation came to us afterwards, in a way, and the notion of the collection, even th seeing that those first card catalogs probably weren't until the mid-late 70s. Um, the first preservation program I started in the mid-late 80s, and it was actually very controversial because people were saying, why is a distributor actually dealing with conservation? I had to justify that. So in a way, we're coming from a, a, a different mindset, which is, which is perhaps, um, again, written into our philosophy was already this notion of the variability and the mutability and the reproducibility, and we had to then impose almost upon that the notion of um, conservation, cataloging, et cetera, which is kind of an interesting inversion for a museum, which is quite different. Um, that's where we will turn the question over to, to John Hanhart. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. Anyway, um, well, i just like to say, I, I, I'm reminded again of a conversation I had with my friends at the Whitney Museum. We had this, uh, we, were, we discussed the issue of, uh, I was asked about a catalog raisonné, which, uh, immediately caused me to say, well, <laughs> a catalog resume of Nam June Pike. Um, and it sort of hovers in the background of this question, you know, uh, when individual works were first were made, shown, um, and, the, and how we can represent and understand 
the various, uh, the movement of an individual piece and so forth. Then there's the question, art historical question of, um, you know, original as it's understood in different media and materials, different art forms, and the traditional histories of connoisseurship through that. So that's um, another layer to the problem because in the media arts this takes on another uh, form, if you will, and a set of issues. Um, I do think, though, that one can um, track uh, where, where particular tapes, let's say, or pieces were shown, and there is often um, documentation that exists. Those original tapes exist, and artworks. And so, um, uh, you know, John was referring to this kind of to and Laurie about the buildup of a work, how it would change, and I did too, about how something would you know, go into different, uh, tapes would go into different pieces and how we have to understand that. But uh, I do think that one can tr uh, track this down, and uh, I think that's going to happen. So much was discovered um, in the archive, paper archive. Why is that making that noise? I am? <laughs> I like the gesture. Um, so I think I do think we can. Um, it's a it's a it's a complicated question, uh, but it's a very useful one, and it's a very useful process, is what I'm saying. Sorry. <laughs> and so, um, and, but I think it's very manageable. I mean, I think that we can do it, and, and uh, you have to understand too that. Pike, uh, as a fluxus uh, artist, working in that period of the avant-garde notion of challenging the art object, challenging permanence, challenging connoisseurship, challenging high institutional valuations, the museum uh, categories of uniqueness and so forth, which goes right back to what we thought was going to happen with video, which was infinite copies that could be democratize and distribute this medium, and now it's, it's of, of course, hit up against the uh, art market and the notions of uniqueness and so forth. So these are, these are, I think, issues that have changed, will change. I think the notion of what, our, what art is going to be is going to continue to, um, to change. So we, we have to understand that as a get background against which to understand Nam June's work. It doesn't value it less. It means we have to understand it differently. And I think that's very important to uh, considering uh, a response to that question, which is a good question. Thank you. Uh, right. does, it, does it work? Yeah. I have a question to John and John. Um, thank you very much for your conversation. It's actually, I have two questions. One is, the first one, the more technical one, is um, how, or can you tell us a little bit more, John Hoffman probably, about the challenges, how to bring CRTs or full bodies of work over the ocean to other power um, environments? You know, we are talking about different voltages and probably more important different frequencies, power frequencies. That's the one question. The other question is, um, we learned, and yesterday I saw the archive, or parts of the archive in the exhibition upstairs, and that is mostly the physical archive, but also the media archive, and that I was just wondering, and I would be very cu cu um, curious to learn more about how Pike himself kept his media archive. So how he, how, how he sorted it through, how he kept it and how he worked with it because he digged it out again and worked over it and I, um, I'm very wondering, I'm, yeah, I'm very curious to learn more about that. Um, well, the tapes were quite chaotic, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how, I don't know how he managed it, it would be beyond my imagination how he managed it. Did he have everything is in his mind? I think it's his, his way of working is. And um, he would give, like at the last lecture, um, Steve Vitello spoke, he gave his people he worked with clues. Like he'd give me some clues, he'd give Steve Vitello some clues. Like 
caretakers of knowledge or something and um, would give Steve a box of tapes here, you just keep this and then Namji would remember, okay, you've got to call Steve Batello and Steve would work with him on that particular project. But post-stroke, of course, things got even more complicated. But yeah, I don't know how he did. And Namjoon would claim that he lost tapes from the 50s and 60s and were never to be seen again. And then someone would help him find one. And he would re-examine it and be thrilled. And I think that's part of what we'll discover with the archive. I mean, Namjoon had a prodigious memory. I mean, and it was always, whenever we sit down with him, he'd remember things. And uh, But there was also a process of rediscovery. So when we visited his loft in 82, it's very different from what's happening now with the work coming into the archive. But I think that as we bore into that archive, dig deeper, we're going to find uh, that much more. But you know, his he would give work away. It, um, Steve Vitiello is uh, gifted to the archive all the notes that he received from Nam June, wonderful gift to the archive. So we, we have that material. And um, as we're working on his collected writings, we're looking to identify more and more because bedded within his writings is a lot of information that is valuable to understanding his work and identifying, you know, we, we have production notes, you know, plans for exhibitions. Um, they're all the ephemera that comes out around a show, gallery guides, that's why I reproduced the gallery guide from the Whitney show in the catalog. Very interesting, you see how, he, how work was arranged in the show. Um, there are the tapes of John Cage's panel discussion from 82, where he talked about Nam June's work in relationship to his own. So I'm just saying is that there's this constant, um, we're rediscovering work, we're bringing the work in, and, um, and then there are the little, uh, which Laurie indicated in the AI, but we have it in the archive, and John knows too, the little notes that are scratched. You know, there's a wall of telephone numbers. Everything has, is kind of this elaborate three-dimensional chess, if you will, of connections. And, um, I think it's all somehow manageable. I just wanted to say <laughs> that if a tape reached a certain level of importance, he would use EAI as a depository and as a personal secretary <laughs> and, as a, and as a FedEx department. And That's right. That's right. So, so if often I would get instructions, go to EAI and grab a tape and bring me a copy so I can re-edit it or rework on it. I also wanted to mention just, just an anecdote I, I was actually going to tell had I more time about button happening. Mm -hmm. um, and in, 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 in preparation for today's symposium, I had some conversations and correspondence with Stephen Vitello actually because he worked so closely on so many of those restoration projects. And we were talking about the, again, the project um, that was spearheaded by John Guggenheim at the time, um, where again, this idea of that exhibition and preservation are so in intrinsically linked because it was in a way exhibition that drove this preservation project, which then drove exhibition. But um, Stephen was, had a stack of half inch open reels to be transferred and some of them Namjoon had scrolled across Chopin and, and then he told Stephen that he had wanted to do a project about Chopin at some point. So Stephen had them all transferred as part of that project and when, when he got them back and we looked at them, it was just the Hollywood movie, uh, uh, I would call it a song to remember about Chopin. <laughs> you know, the entire movie just filmed off of TV, except for the last two minutes was button happening. And then June's watching it said, oh, that was my first videotape I ever made, the Liberty Music it's Shop in 1965, that's hence story. that's where Button Happening was discovered. So again, this, this process of, of, you know, and, you, and, and someone had to watch that through all the way to find it, but, but Nam June's earliest extant piece was found at the end of a random, re maybe, well, no, no, not random, a reel of, of a, a Hollywood movie on Chopin. Sorry, could the panel comment to the installation of Pike's work abroad and the challenges oh, of um, <laughs> voltage and frequency in particular? Sorry. <laughs> the first question. Um, yeah, he would send uh, sea containers full of equipment across the channels, and um, you know, there didn't seem to be a frequency problems ever. I, I, 
Uh, yeah, I would actually say that a vast majority of the, the works that are in our permanent collection are actually not necessarily U.S. voltage uh, or frequency. And so you end up with a power supply in between to make up for the voltage. I mean, sometimes we plan an exhibition or a project and just buy in Germany, in France for that project. Uh, Megatron Matrix, for instance, you may have noticed is on European current. And uh, we have step-up transformers behind the work below all of the uh, the the array of televisions, so uh, the the power is managed after it comes off of the grid in the museum. Um, we have a couple of uh, pieces on loan that are also on European current, and uh, it's sort of managed at the artwork level uh, inside the pedestal, uh, but still connected to our uh, show control system. Uh, it's just managed on there's sort of there's there's a little firewall between the two. Um, and it hasn't, we haven't had any problems with um, uh, the frequency or frame weight or hertz or anything like that, if that's what uh, uh, you were specifically referring to. I mean, it's been pretty. It's been fine. Actually, I would say that Pike even actually dealt with it often on, you know, if, I guess if he knew where, where a piece was going. For example, uh, the Zen for TV that's in our collection, um, if you take off the back panel, uh, what's interesting is the case has nothing to do with the actual tube and signal board that's inside of it. The TV that's actually in tube that's in there is actually European voltage, and inside of the case is actually the switch mode, so that <laughs> it's plugged out whenever it comes out with a you know power switch for U.S. voltage, but it's not. Um, and I guess actually one person who might speak to it is is our certified electronics technician uh, Dan Meyer. <laughs> uh, Mm -hmm. Those are actually Samsung TVs that uh, are made for 110, and then uh, they uh, put an isolation transformer on each TV right. so they could operate over 220 volts, and then they came to the museum. And so even though they operate at 110, they, they go from 110 to 220, and then from 220 back to 110. I think this is actually a really important point uh, <laughs> that uh, inside the case for a TV, maybe components from four or five different television sets as well as other pieces of electronic equipment. And that, was, that came from his studio. So we have a precedent in place on how to handle sort of reorganizing the electronics in, so inside the piece in order to present it in an exhibition in a, in a way that's really, it, it's just the, the, the ways in which he worked with the material which give us insight into his process. Uh, it was, it, it's really, uh, it's quite easy for us to access when we're carrying this forward in future exhibitions and from a conservation standpoint. I think um, we may only have time for one more question. I remember, oh dear, right, I see a few hands. The gentleman at the microphone. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Dan Sonnet. I'm a media producer and formerly with the National Endowment for the Arts. I guess I have a very general question that could serve as kind of a wrap up, both from a uh, technical point of view and from an aesthetic point of view. As you go through the collection and now after his death, what can we kind of uh, draw or communicate both from the museum environment and even down to kind of media literacy, media education from his legacy? That's like a, the aesthetic question. Also technically, as formats keep changing, how would it be most useful within the museum community um, to, for artists to document their work uh, what kind of metadata could they be collecting now that could contribute to the understanding of their work, but also to the revisioning and repurposing of their work for the future? Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll answer the, the second question, and then I think John may have a better, better perspective for the first question. Um, but uh, I think we'll hear actually from Anne later this afternoon about uh, other initiatives that are going on about interviewing artists and things like this to, to develop metadata meta structures to support their work in a museum collection. Um, I think as a, in a museum, we're largely responsible for developing what that data structure might look like. Uh, and Laurie mentioned having you know, an extraordinarily large number of fields uh, to support each artwork. Um, I think that, that each piece is different, each piece is unique, and they all have a, they each, individual artwork presents a unique set of challenges, so they all 
they have, there has to be some flexibility inside those uh, metadata structures, but basically we have, I mean, there are a number of people working at it from different perspectives. Um, did you want to, sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna say uh, also the, um, the guidelines that were established by John Apolito when he was at the Guggenheim Museum preserving the material, uh, creating um, basic information interviews um, and uh, descriptions of the possibilities of migration become a really interesting, it was a very interesting source for this, uh, for thinking about that work. But uh, just to, to your first question, um, which is a large one, um, in terms of Nam Jun's importance, I mean, uh, in describing his life and career and his transformation in the video and his movement from performance and music and composition to transforming the very idea of the electronic moving image as a contemporary art form and seeing the model of television as a way to distribute and really return television to a communication, meaning two-way, and making that also interactive, these different modalities and ways of thinking about television speak to media literacy because it's all about understanding the moving image, the power of it, how it's composed, and how it's, uh, uh, how it's structured. And through his writings, which talk everything from imagining, as you see, the, one of the texts, um, expanded education for a media society, the, one of the texts in the uh, archive wall. He writes in the late 1960s about uh, online education and, and uh, essentially anticipating that. And his whole writings and theorizations were that. And so if you put all of that together with actually looking at his videotapes, they show um, a real remodeling of the notion of, of media and television. And I think to all new generations, they give a way to see the power of the historical avant-garde and the power of the moving image to uh, transform our understanding of ourselves and the world around us. And that's essentially what he was doing. He was looking at the body, humanizing technology as a model, as well as looking at media as a true form of democratic communication. Thank you, I think that's a great place to end. So thanks to all of our panelists. <laughs>